Welcome to TEDx Gallatin Art and Science. Uh, my name is Shiva Rizvani, and today I'm going to be talking about a history of fashion and science of sex. I'm going to be presenting a portion of my own thesis research here at Gallatin, where I'm looking at ways in which a rising medical authority, as well as the popularity of the health and hygiene movement, was used uh, by different groups to deal with shame around sex. So I want to start actually with an important medical question, which is, why would someone want to stick a vibrator in their eye? <laughs> well, according to the 1924 catalog for the Arnold Massage Vibrator, it was for your health. So this catalog uh, was using medical justifications for any kind of bodily ailment you could possibly have. So from weak, watery eyes and failing eyesight to neuralgia headaches, as well as deafness. <laughs> it could also help with the building of body mass. So for example, underdevelopment in this case, or underdevelopment of men in their muscles. And not only could the product help with the building of body mass, but somehow, miraculously, vibrations could also help with the slimming of body mass, as in this case, in correcting health lines. So ultimately, this catalog for the Arnold Massage Vibrator is one long medical justification for every possible, possible ailment you could have except for the sexual one that it was actually used for. So why the medical emphasis on this product? Well, by 1924, vibrators already had a long-standing relationship with medicine. So take this example here. This is an illustration of the first handheld vibrator. It was actually meant um, for doctors in use uh, for the treatment of hysteria in women. Uh, this particular version of the handheld vibrator used crank technology and watch technology to deal with vibration was not electric. So the practice of getting women to orgasm in a doctor's office was actually considered a clinical procedure. It was not considered a sexual one. And why exactly was there this medical justification? I think the best way to deal with this, the best way to think about it, is to look at another example from my research, which is, I think, bringing me to my next question, which is, what exactly is radical underwear? And if your answer was open crotch Victorian style underwear, you were almost correct. In this example here from 1902 from the Sears Robot Catalog, you can see here that you have the option of buying both open and cro closed crotch styles. And what this mean, means essentially is that uh, along the seam of the crotch, the underwear is just not sewn together. So this is just, again, another example of a radical uh, and strange behavior around sex and fashion at the turn of the 20th century. So between both open and closed crotch styles, one of them was considered modest, while the other one was considered radical. And it was not the one that you thought. So the Sears Roebuck catalog instructs its customers that when we quote open and closed styles, be sure to state style desired. Otherwise, we will send open style, which are more in demand. So the surprising thing here is not that open crotch styles were more popular, but that open crotch styles were actually considered modest at the time. So why is this exactly? Well, closed crotch styles were actually associated with freedom, independence, and mobility. So to understand why open crotch styles even existed in the first place and why, why this transition occurred and how, we'd have to look at, I think, uh, go back into the early 1800s and the mid 19th century. This example here is a satirical cartoon of fashions from 1850. Here it's called A Splendid Spread. And it is satirizing the extremely restrictive clothing that existed for women in this time period. Not only did they have the bone crushing corsets, but they had these pounds and pounds of skirts that they had to wear. And this is the, the main reason that they had to have open crotch underwear so that they could go to the bathroom. Uh, now, uh, this, the contemporary equivalent of this would be a fly in men's boxers. So women not only had to deal with 
uh, this restrictive mobility, but they also had to deal with the fear of essentially falling over and exposing themselves, uh, as in this example from 1840, a street view, quote unquote. Uh, so ma many women in this time period uh, were essentially sick and tired of the physical restrictions that they had to deal with with fashion. So um, as in this example with the crinoline cage that they were wearing under their skirts. So the dress reform movement um, took shape and uh, they came up with a new fashion called the bloomer costume as seen here. Now the bloomer costume was a feminine style that had already existed for quite some time, but it, had, it didn't exist in a public arena. It existed in forms of uh, ath athletics as well as in sanatoriums. So when, when the dress reformers brought this into the public, people reacted very badly. So here are some satirical cartoons of, uh, of dress reformers wearing the bloomer costume. Uh, they're seen as deviant as well as, uh, and they're shown as deviant in examples of them smoking, for example, or in being unpatriotic, as in this example on the left. So the dress reformers decided they were going to turn to invisibles. This is how they were going to make their fashion change. Uh, they no longer could wear the bloomer costume because it was ridiculed into oblivion after about a decade. Um, so in this example here, you can see the quote, at least we can begin with the invisibles and reform ourselves from within. Um, this, this wording of saying invisibles was actually a euphemism for underwear. So not only was the reform invisible, but underwear was also invisible. So how exactly were they going to make it popular? How were they going to make this change in fashion popular? Well, they decided that they were going to make it about health. So the dress reformers rode the wave of popularity associated with the health and hygiene movement. And in this example, you can see a perfect health corset, right? So there was this extreme popularity around hygienic underwear systems in this time period. And the ability to use the word hygiene and health as it was associated with fashion at this time at that point made it not radical. So it started with radical in public to invisible and hygienic. So what does this have to do with modest slash erotic drawers or sticking a vibrator in your eye? Well, the point is that both the 1924 vibrator and the 1902 uh, drawer styles point to schisms in history with odd sexual behaviors that don't make sense in our contemporary mindset. And both examples are on an edge of transition that must be justified with medical authority and therefore hiding the shame and the invisibility that existed around sex and genitalia in this time period. The scientific justification that existed really is what made sticking a vibrator in your eye an art of medical science as well as wearing closed crotch underwear, a hygienic science of art. Thank you so much.